I'm really excited to have Jamia here. Uh, Jamia is somebody that I've known from a long time, from our days at uh, IMG. We go but back. Um, she has had a, an incredible career, somebody that can talk about juniors, that can talk about pros, that can talk about college, and now all those things combined. She's somebody that in juniors won the 14s and 16s hard courts, uh, turned pro, was high as 43 in the world. She played Fed Cup. She played all the Grand Slams. And unfortunately, at a young age, she had a lot of hip injuries that had to uh, have her have a very early retirement with such a promising career. Um, after that, she was an assistant coach at Oklahoma State University, uh, turned that program around, did an incredible job. And then I believe since 2013, you've been a, a USDA national coach. So that there's so much to talk about in so many different areas. But one thing that I found is that, tell me if this is correct, that you're the first person ever to challenge a call. Wow, well, yeah. You, you are the marks. first person. What's that? Yeah, yeah, you hit all the marks, and yes, that's like my claim to fame. <laughs> the <laughs> first it. person ever to challenge. First person the ever in um, like sanctioned competition because they had used it before for um, World Team Tennis and like stuff like that exhibitions, nice. but in sanctioned a sanctioned match at uh, Miami. It was uh, Nasdaq then, but the Miami Open. Yeah. Miami Open. That's, that's, something, that's something. That's something oh, unique. Goodness. Yeah, I get that question more than any other question, yeah, actually. Okay. <laughs> well, so. wh why, don't, why don't we start a little bit about uh, your junior career? I know you're originally from Atlanta, and you have uh, great athletes in your family, but tell us a little bit about you growing up and your journey in the, in the juniors. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I'll, I'll um, give you kind of a summary. I grew up in a family that everyone played tennis. They grew up in the, uh, or, you know, they came of age. They were, they met each other during like the Arthur Ashe age. So like tennis was huge. My father played, my mother played, my brother played. So I started playing, obviously I wanted to be just like them, just like big bro. Um, my father did play professional football in the seventies. And so I kind of got my work ethic and my dreams uh, to succeed and to become a professional athlete from him and um, started working with some of the family friends. Uh, Coach Peterson in Atlanta was his name. And he, I mean, a ton of players went through his program and um, went on to become like really, really good players. I know Sloan went through that program, um, both of the Jenkins, um, who everyone knows as, you know, the hitting partner for Serena and uh, Venus and Naomi's coach. And so a lot of us like went through that program, grew up together, learned the game and um, came to love the game and understand what it took to, to go far. And so, yeah, I lived there, played there until I was 11 or 12 when I moved to Volatary's where I met you yeah. now IMG Academies and um, trained there pretty much between there and Miami with the USDA for the rest of my junior, junior career. Well, so like one of the things that I think for me always stood out about you is that off the court, you're like the nicest person. You are like always smiling, always happy, always social, but like on the court, you are always such a professional. Like your work ethic and your intensity on court, it was, it was always very uh, evident. So like, can you talk a little bit, where does that come from? Is that internally, is that was it your coaches, your parents, everybody? Like, that's something that I, I really always uh, admired about you. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely, it was a combination for me. I was always pretty serious whenever I had a task um, that I wanted to complete. So it's a little bit probably nature. Um, I know coaches like who see me now, who knew me then, they told me I like had crazy eyes when I was <laughs> on the court. <laughs> so like, I think that I've become even more aware of it now than I was when I was a player. It was very natural. And also, I think that it was something that my coaches and my parents kind of noticed about me and tried to um, encourage with, with what I did. Like, um, like I said, I had a father who played football, and that's as intense as it gets, you know, um, because if you're not focused and you're not doing things right in that sport, I mean, you get hurt. You can, can get very seriously hurt. And so he kind of established in me 
um, um, a dedication to like doing things right when I was on court and the way he kind of always described it was, you know, you're, you're a kid and you're a kid off court, you know, but when, when you're on court, then you're focused and you are, you know, intent on what you're doing and you're going to give a hundred percent. And if you do that, then, you know, that's all that you can really expect and control. That's what they expected of me. So that's kind of what I expect of myself. Sounds like you delivered. Um, so let, let me fast forward a little bit. Um, was there a decision to go to college versus pro and when did that happen and what was that decision like? Right. So for me, I was kind of a part of that last generation that players were hitting it really big, really young. I mean, Maria is, you know, a year younger yeah. um, than me. We're all kind of, you know, the same generation and she, she won Wimbledon at 17, you know, yeah. and we were just after Hingis and Kornikova and, and that generation of players who, yeah. I mean, Hingis won a first slam at 14, you know, so yeah. It was in my mind to turn pro very young. I really um, didn't entertain college at that age the way that I would now if I was playing now. It was just, it was a different time. So the decision, I made it young and I stuck with it. Nice. And yeah. what was, what was uh, obviously, I guess there's so many different things to talk about pro being a pro, but can you tell a little bit for like uh, the kids that are, watching this and we'll be watching this what is what is something that is obvious about being a pro player and playing the grand slams and what's it like maybe like traveling and doing the laundry and doing all the extra things that people don't see like what is the the hardest part and the best part about being a, a pro yeah athlete? that's a great question i mean it's so funny because now i i really just kind of think about my career in ways to like relate to the kids you know I think that it's something that can't really be taken away from me but at the same time um, I really haven't um, thought about these questions in a long time so these are really really great but from my perspective as both a player and a pro I mean a player and a coach is I just I think that there's such a disconnect between what people see and what it really is, you know, like you really only see the players when they are performing. And that is, that is such a small sliver, the amount of work that goes into um, being able to perform at that level at that stage under the lights with all these eyes on you and so much on the line, the players now and myself, the players before, I mean, how hard we worked with tennis, with fitness, off court, how much we were searching for video back then, like was pre YouTube, you know, but we were looking for an edge, which at that time was, you know, sports psychology, getting more into nutrition. Now like Dartfish has come such a long ways. And so you see the players watching video all the time, whether it's something that's specific to them, something that is um, about their opponent that they're trying to catch, pick up on one or two things that they can apply. So I just think that the amount of work that goes into it, for a player is kind of oh, is underestimated um, is there, a lot. Is there, um, I know this is a general question because it's all different, different tournaments, different parts of the season, but whether it's you or current players in a, a typical 24, 48 hour, you know, two days, what does the training look like? Like, you know, I guess I, again, everybody trains different times and differently, right. but what right. is a, if somebody is going to say, what does a professional training schedule look like to you? What would you say? Yeah. Um, great question. It definitely depends on the time of the year. You know, yeah. um, tennis is 11, 11, 10 to 11 months, depending on, you know, where your ranking hits, where you lie. And it's going to vary those off season times or the training blocks. I mean, at the beginning, it's two fitnesses a day, one tennis, if I can just like take a snapshot there. And the fitnesses are both two sessions of two hours and like the, the players are killing themselves, you know, they're on the track, they're in the fields, they're sand, they're doing workouts on court, they're in the gym lifting, like all of that. And then, you know, they're on court maybe for an hour or so. And it's more technical, it's more focused, more 
intricate the changes that they're making and then as preseason goes on and they're getting stronger then um they'll move to like two practices a day and one fitness but it'll still be you know five or so hours and just like killing it on court killing it in the gym and like trying their best to recover so they can come back the next day and do it again you know and it's it's a fine balance you know because obviously they want to stay healthy so they have a lot of people who are managing their level of output you know um they're there's so many gadgets now where you're seeing how much people are sleeping and the people who know them know them really well. So they know kind of when they need to break, when to pull back and when to push a little bit harder. But yeah, the days, if I'm being just super general, will kind of like look like that during a training block. And then, um, you know, a tournament, then a lot of them, after all this work they've put in, they're really trying to maintain for most of it. Um, especially at the big tournaments, there may be some tournaments that they train through. So they play a match and then they go have a practice and they do fitness and they'll do that for the whole week because they're thinking, okay, like I need to be peaking three weeks down the road. So I need to really make sure that I'm putting my emphasis on maintaining all that work that I did during preseason. So, I mean, it's periodization and Mm -hmm. it's, it's down to the last, you know, minute pretty much for, for the top pros, but it's a lot of work and like, it's a labor of love. Like they get in and they, they they do their best they love it so it's pretty cool to see I was I was gonna ask this later but but since you answered that question so well so how about for a a pretty good 12 to a 14 year old junior how similar and how different do you advise that to look like with that be yeah depends on each you know everyone's body some people are going to be more and um farther developed at that time and some are still going to be going through like growth um you know some are still going to be like completely underdeveloped and so it's more stage i'd say than age um i like at that, that <laughs> is that a saying is that an original yeah. thing <laughs> no it's not i stole it i, I wish i could I you should have just it, taken I stole it. it i know i know you're recording this and i'm not gonna get in trouble <laughs> so yeah so it would be for them um they would still be in the gym you know but it would be like a lot more teaching the proper way to do things and it would be a lot more um body weight type exercises more like running and less so like of the lifting and the deadlifts and the the um the weights that the the pros would do but the the on court would be very very similar it just may not be as long you know there are going to be times where they whereas a pro because they built up so much intensity they're going to be able to go for an hour and a half, two hours, you know, day after day after day, practice after practice. But the the young players may only be able to go for 45 minutes to an hour with quality intensity. And nice. that's kind of the, the, the difference. I think that the players will will try and play longer and mm-hmm. they'll end up like not even realizing they're doing it, but kind of going through the motions for a portion of it and cruising through it, thinking to get to that like in point of practice and so during that time then they may develop some bad habits and um may be slowing themselves down training and making themselves slower doing things that they you know wouldn't want to be doing in a tournament in order to like reach the certain amount of time and so the timing the amount of time the kids are going to spend on court may be less but like the intensity with the moving i'm not saying like that they should be hitting the ball as hard or anything like that but the the structure of their practices, how physical the practices are, that's going to be pretty similar. Um, and maybe it's a situation where instead of going for two hours hard and physical like a pro would, then it's going to be, you know, an hour hard, but then 30 to 40 minutes more technical because they're still going to be learning a lot of things. They're going to be learning, you know, a lot of situations like slicing, more transition skills, because everyone kind of, you know, learns from the baseline first. And most players do that very yeah. well as the cornerstone of their game. So starting to add more parts into their game can be what like extends the time. But I think that the intensity and the effort level for, for their age, what I see from the young players who get really, really good. I mean, you saw it with Maria. I mean, yeah. how intense was she, you know? Like I think her dad was the most intense, though. That's you know? 
<laughs> so yeah, I mean that into that level of professionalism, like being a pro is not signing on the dotted line. Being a pro is not taking money. Like being a pro is that mentality and that intensity. Wow. That, that, that's, that's well said. That's going to be our clip we're going to use later. I really yeah. like that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, let me, let me go back well, a little bit again to talk about your pro career. So you got, tell me a little bit about like your favorite experience, favorite win. Maybe it was beating Maria, your fellow. Uh, uh, that was a good one. <laughs> or, you know, like, do you have a, you know, experience playing Wimbledon or US Open and from the American crowd? What is your favorite memory? Uh, yeah, me? there's, a, I mean, there's a lot of them. And I think when you asked me that question of what were my favorite moments, I mean, it's hard to pick one. Um, they're all competing, you know. Um, if I like had to pick one, I think for me, it was Fed Cup. I think that that was just an amazing experience. Actually, Leslie was there. She was part of our team that year, which was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I there mean, you like, go. you know, <laughs> that was a tough week, you know? <laughs> that was a really tough week for me. Um, you know, I felt so much pressure. I really wanted to deliver for the team. Um, there's nothing like, I think a lot of people play tennis. I certainly play tennis as an individual sport, you know, and I loved that portion of it. And then going into a team situation was quite the adjustment. And I really wanted to, to um, be there and pull my weight for my team. And we went through a lot that week with um, anxieties about what would happen, you know, um, just sort of, I would say it was like, I was like, I was, I was just like lightning, you know, like I was popping off every single second because of um, my own inner stresses and I didn't even know it, you know? And so working through that with my mom was there and Zena was our um, head coach and Kathy was our um, co-captain and Lori McNeil was there, and um, like I said, Leslie was there, and working through that with those coaches and my team, we were like totally not expected to win. We were very much so underdogs, and I mean, everyone stepped up unbelievable that weekend, and just kind of hearing, you know, game, set, match, USA, like there's just nothing like it, <laughs> and so for me, yeah, that was probably like that is definitely the moment that I think about the most. That's the week that I think about the most. And so if I had to pick like one, that would be number one. Like, well, Leslie down. sent me a message saying she delivered, we got her straight. So there ah! you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she asked some questions. She might get like real like deep about what happened <laughs> that week because it was a lot. But that's like how it is, you know? Maybe that's we'll do, maybe see, we'll do the next know? interview just about that. We'll just do Oh that. God. <laughs> Oh God, we, how much time do you have? Because like, we're, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, that's, uh, I guess we'll, we'll maybe connect with that a little bit later. Tell me, yeah. um, you know, the decision to retire very early and the yeah. hip injuries, um, obviously yeah. it's, it's really difficult and, you know, playing with pain and knowing when it's, it, you can't, can you right. talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I think, and all, all, of, all of the questions that you have, they're very linked, you know, in my mind. And I think that uh, that is one of the toughest things, one of the things that people don't always see and people don't always want to show, you know, like that was a really tough time for me, you know, like the anxieties and the pains, physically, mentally, like emotionally that you go through as an athlete that you have to kind of overcome that make you stronger. That's something that probably, you know, isn't as visible, but that was really, that was really tough. I had been like hurt throughout my career, but it was, it was always small. It was mostly muscular, um, hamstring pulls and, and things of that nature. And when I hurt my hip for the first time, that was actually the week that I got to my highest ranking. So I was 19 and um, I was playing a tournament and I don't know where I was. I think I was in Thailand. And that kind of started the domino effect that was, you know, the injuries that led to the ending of my career. I ended up needing three surgeries, um, two hips and a, and a stomach repair. And after rehabbing those, having those surgeries and rehabbing for roughly 
two and a half years, like my surgeon basically told me that I would need one more surgery on both hips at least to rid myself of like scar tissue that had developed just because that's how I healed. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that I kind of decided to take a break from tennis because I'd already been like a patient for two years, which is something that I think athletes really struggle with kind of going. I mean, I think people in general, but I know certainly like all the athletes that I have talked to who have had career ending injuries, you know, going from being so confident in your body and that it's there for you when you need it to, you know, having this patient mentality when you're so, that you're so reliant on other people. Yeah. And that shift is a real struggle, like emotionally. And also the shift of having to begin to figure out very young um, and very quickly who you are if you're not playing tennis, mm-hmm. you know, um, those two things were super difficult adjustments for me to go through. Um, but when I, when I did hear that I needed two more surgeries, I did decide to take a break. There were two times within like the next couple of years that I tried to come back and I saw a couple different surgeons. And every time I tried to come back, I did get injured. I'm sure I overdid it, you know, just thinking yeah. that I could do what I did before, like way too quickly. And um, yeah, it just got to the point where I, I wanted to walk. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of, having a father who played football, just a lot of, he's, totally healthy, you know, but I have so many, my godfather, so many of his friends who are, their bodies are wrecked, you know, mm. and that to me, and I, I know some people who play tennis as well with me, because it's, it's such a difficult sport on your body, like people just don't even know, but having people um, who I played with really just like now being like, God, I just, I want to walk without pain, you know, mm. that is something that I really didn't want for myself and for my own identity and my future life. And so those were kind of all like decisions that went into me deciding to um, build a life kind of beyond just pro tennis. But it was, it was very difficult for a long time, for sure. It was hard to, to watch the slams sometimes and see players who I had beaten, you know, moving yeah. through to the second week, to the semis, to the finals, things like that. Like it's just, yeah. it was an, it took an emotional toll, but I got through it. So it's all good. I really appreciate you, you know, you know, I wouldn't say being vulnerable, but sharing all this because I'm sure people watching this, they are either have gone through or will go through injuries and just the mindset of knowing you're not alone and that other people think that way and you question yourself and you, you, there's so many different thoughts that happen. So I, I think that's really great. I'm sure you give a great perspective to, uh, to anyone going through that. So I really appreciate that. Um, so let's, let's, then let's move over now to your college coaching. So now you go from a player to a coach. That's yeah, first of all, immediately. welcome. <laughs> I know. It's no longer about you. It's no longer about you. At all. <laughs> no longer at about all. you. <laughs> you know, Quickly, and yeah. you, you realize that I thought about you quickly. <laughs> yes, totally. Tell, tell, tell me what are some of your, your favorite experiences there? What, mm-hmm. what did you learn? Yeah. Um, what did you learn and what did you enjoy? Yeah. Um, getting a chance to coach for Oklahoma State was like such a blessing for me because um, the, I mean, for so many reasons. First of all, like, The school was a godsend. I actually, while I was there, I was there for four years and I actually got my degree. So that was um, like amazing that I was able to do that through the school. And, um, you know, Stillwater is just like a a good, like kind of down hometown. My parents are both from like small towns. And so it was kind of a place that I could go and like heal a little bit. I made like so many just great friends and was able to kind of build this life outside of like tennis, which was like a great adjustment for me. And then like the team was just phenomenal. I, I, um, from Chris on down, and I think that his leadership definitely like laid the groundwork for the kind of coach that I hope to become one day, as well as like what the kids, how they were able to transform from, you know, us recruiting them to them, you know, going on to graduate and going into some other part of their life, be it coaching or, um, you know, a couple of people are in finance, whatever it may be. So um, 
how it going from going from playing as a pro to coaching was like, yeah, definitely like a shift, but Chris really prepared me kind of for what was expected. And, um, for, I think you don't realize it as a player, like you think about it afterwards, like how all these moments and all these decisions that you make, how they affect other people. There were so many coaches that I called and I was like, I was thinking this exact same way when I was a teenager and I am so sorry because like, <laughs> yeah. I see that, yes, that is crazy and I'm going to help her through this. And, you know, mm. so it was, um, it was good. But also being with college kids was really great because they had, they had some agency and, you know, they understood, they had a, a good base knowledge already. And so we were able to connect in in a good way um and and helped me like really learn learn how to how to teach yeah. instead of like kind of what i saw as like kind of coaching that i had been getting kind of the last few years of my my tennis career which so, i thought was like super helpful so that's that brings me into a, a question that i want to know and let's put those four years plus the last few years being a national coach okay if you go back in time and coach your younger self you coaching yeah. yourself what would you say or do differently or would you not want to coach yourself uh no i think i would want to coach myself like i feel like i was very coachable like <laughs> i was a hot mess but i was very coachable but i think that what i would have though i had i had a lot of great coaches you know and so I can only say this like really knowing myself and knowing the decisions I made and why I made them. But I try and always with um, the girls that I work with is just um, imp find ways to increase their levels of confidence, you know, and impart their belief in themselves. Because I think as like a, a, um, a junior, I, you know, I could have had more just, I, I was better than I thought I was, you know, and um, I had more skills than I thought I did. And I don't think that I gave myself like enough credit. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I was so focused on what I wasn't good at and what I need to get better at, which is so important as well. And so it's a, it's a, you know, yep. all about yep. balance. Yep. Yeah. You can't, we can't go too far um, one way or the other, but I think that's a reason why, and, I, and when I moved to Baltimore City, that was like super hard for me. I don't know how that was for you, yeah. but to go into a completely different, you know, like environment than was my life was very hard. It was very important to be in an environment that was that competitive. Yeah. And I think that we all pushed each other and we all made each other better. But like building yourself is an important part of it. And I think that you can lose some of that when you like move out of like, your environment, your growth and environment at a young formative age, you know, um, into something that's very tennis specific. Mm. So it, I think, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think I just want to give myself more credit on and off court. That, so positive praise, positive praise. Like <laughs> yes, exactly. Is that, is yeah, to your own heart, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, you were always so intense, you would have probably, probably not even listened. You'd be like, I wouldn't have listened. I totally wouldn't. I wouldn't have heard a word. Like, that's like, the thing. Like, your backhand looks great. Attention. You're like, stop talking to me. My <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, okay. And then, like, they had to say it five times before yeah. it, like, even registered. You so, it might have made a difference. Yeah. <laughs> so is there, do you have a, a uh, a coaching philosophy is there a cornerstone for your coaching philosophy obviously every co player you coach is different and right you need to be reached differently but do you have few cornerstones yeah I mean like like I said before like if I like use something that someone else is like I'm gonna say like I, I would there's no need for me to like reinvent the wheel you know and do something badly that's already been done well that I can duplicate so I mean I definitely subscribe to Jose Higueras's um, coaching philosophy, because I think that that's how I think about tennis and that's how I coach. And the way it's put um, into words and into, on paper is like so simple and masterful. But I totally agree. I mean, I think that I want for my players, since I am working with them, you know, 13, 14, 15, I want them even a little bit older, 16. Um, we can include those in there. But I want for them to, to have as complete a game as possible. Like when I do look back on my career, I always felt like like my forehand was a little bit of a hole and I felt like that held me back, you know, and for sure, like uh, my mentality about it did as well. But I think the stroke itself was um, if it were a little bit more solid and just the fund fundamentally strong, then I think I could have 
you know, been a better player, which is what it's all about. It's all about becoming the best player that you can be, not necessarily yeah. like results. So, um, I mean, if you become the best player that you can be and you train hard and you compete hard, you're gonna like the results will out. So I think giving them the most complete game is like a big portion, a huge chunk of that philosophy. And then, I mean, I think like his uh, five P's are like huge, you know, like he has like patience, uh, progressions, planning and goals, um, problem solving, which I think is huge and something that like we don't necessarily talk about enough. And um, I think parameters was maybe the one that I missed, but like that kind of encompasses all of tennis, right? Like parameters yeah. encompasses like your stroke, like production, like as long as you're kind of within the bounds of what's acceptable, there's, a, there's so many different ways to hit the ball well, you know, but there's also a lot of ways once you get outside those bounds, you know, unless you're incredibly gifted or incredibly strong or incredible athlete, you're going to limit yourself, you know, if you have yeah. extreme grips or things like that. So the parameters of stroke production, the problem solving and the mentality of playing tennis that that um, pertains to patience as a coach, you know, because I think that's hard for all of us to really be patient because it takes so long. It's a marathon. Yeah. It takes so long to create a good tennis player. And that obviously bleeds into like planning, you know, and having developmental plans and sitting down with your player and setting goals. And their schedule is so important at a young age as well as they get older. And then progression is like actually the tennis part, you know, as far as how you teach any stroke that you you know you slow it down and you you simplify it and as they get better you open it up and the ball comes harder and you do more live ball drills and if they need to go back then you yeah. go to more progressions as well so I think that his philosophy is like really 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 good and it kind of like I've kind of adopted it I know I really a lot of words. That was no it's good, no, it's good. <laughs> there's I, Jose is is, is uh you know, I remember one of my first meetings with him and we were, he was asking what's a great tennis player and everybody's like naming a bunch of different qualities, what makes a great tennis player. And then we, you know, he's like, you get, no, nobody said it. <laughs> everybody's looking at each other. I mean, you know, you name everything. And he's like, results, unless you win a grand slam, you're not a great tennis player. <laughs> and everybody was like, Wow. <laughs> it was like, the the whole point. <laughs> He's like all of that is right. He's like, all of those things you mentioned are right, but you're missing one meeting. <laughs> After that, like every time you speak, I'm like, make sure everything you say is on point. So. Yeah, exactly. And Kathy was the same thing, you know, and those are the kind of people like you've learned enough, you've been around them enough, you've seen like what they say kind of come to fruition you know to like yeah. where they when they speak like you listen you know? yeah <laughs> uh -huh. so can you tell uh, a little bit uh, to people about what is the, your life of being a national coach what is that uh again i'm sure seasonal it's different but what does that look like and what are your duties and responsibilities right so i mean we have i think we have like 13 or 14 coaches on the girl side and uh, that covers like the whole span of um, of women's tennis as far as like player development is is um, is concerned and so everybody has like very very different roles and so like mine would be kind of just pertaining to me so I am in charge of um, team USA like transition which is um, I work with uh, a couple other coaches really closely. I'm really overlooking the 2003s, that age group. So those girls are turning 17 this year. And then kind of after that, um, they start to transition into like closer knit teams and just pros. And so like for me, I'll do um, kind of three things. And that's number one is like training blocks or training weeks at the national campus or anywhere whatever it could be before uh french it could be in uh spain at btt or whatever it may be but training camps and then i will travel with the girls to some of the like higher pro tournament i mean higher junior tournaments i'm sorry so the slams basically and other great a's around the world but really mostly just the slams and um and also to like trying to get the players to maximize their 
pro tournaments. So like, you know, for instance, when players can females, obviously, because guys don't have the age eligibility limitations that girls do. So this is just pertaining to females, but when they turn 14 and they can initially start playing pro tournaments, they get eight tournaments and very few players actually like um, exhaust that whole list of tournaments that they can play, which is really a shame because that's where you can learn the most, you know, now I'm not saying that you only play those and you play nothing else by no means. Am I saying that, you know, but if you want, want to be a pro and you want to like see where your game measures up against the pros, what you do really, really well that you can, um, get to be one of the best in the world at that's going to help you transition to the next level or like what is maybe a little bit of a hole that you need to like tighten up. The best way to see that is to see it, you know? So, um, like it's pretty young, you know, 14, 15, 16, that we're starting to take these, these girls to pro tournaments and it's still happening that young. I know it's taking them long, longer to transition number one, because, um, the age eligibility rule obviously has a, a portion of that, but that was back when like Maria played. So um, they have reduced the number of tournaments. And so that's kind of one of the reasons why. And also there's a lot less points at the like ITF level than there used to be. And mm-hmm. players obviously are a lot stronger. So for those three reasons, it does take players longer to transition through to the WTA, through to the slams, blah, blah, blah on a macro level. Now you always will have the outliers like Coco, you know, who's just unbelievable, you know, and she'll just break through. But the majority of the players, there's a lot of good ones who have to battle through that level for a little bit longer than it used to be, but they still like, you've got to be at that level. You've got to be playing every top hundred American girl in the last, I want to say like 11, 12 years. I saw a stat. They all, they all played at least three or four, um, pro tournaments at the age of 14 if not more some of them won a 15k a 10k maybe when they were juniors whatever because it just did just change to 15ks but and most of them a lot of them like played all eight so you got to do it so uh, just real quick for everybody who's listening um we went through a lot of questions i have about five more that people have emailed me Um, If you have any questions, you can type it for here, and then uh, I'll try to get as many questions as possible. We have another 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, so uh, feel free to ask any questions. Um, Back back to you, coach, uh, (laughs) national coach. You're Um, doing so well. Like, great job. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I try. Got to prepare for the best, you know? Oh, gosh. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) Well, well, let me let me ask you this, because this is something I'm very curious as well, Um, because it's a question I get asked and I always tell people that I really don't know. You take your best guess. But when you get a group of like 10 girls that come to a camp or like 12 years old and um, they all have different strengths and weaknesses, how accurate have you been with predicting like who's going to really be the cream of the crop? Because to me, it's a very difficult decision. And so, uh, you know, I want to get your take on it. What's that? You know how rich I would be if I could like predict this. Like I would be, oh, oh my gosh. Like I would be, I don't even know, on the moon. So Hopefully you would still do the interview with me. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, obviously. No, I mean, I think that you have some of the more, um, some kids who come through, especially girls, it's a little easier. And uh, some are just so good at that age. I mean, like, you know, Amanda obviously was, very good at that age, Um, amazing eyes, and um, Coco, obviously, as well, just the the mentality, you know, the maturity of those those players, and the the work ethic at such a young age, like, they stand out, where you're like, okay, they've got, they've got something, you know, Um, but I don't think that, I haven't seen anybody who is always right, that's for sure, you know, so um, I'm not going to claim that I'm always right by any means mm-hmm. <laughs> either, for sure. I don't think you ever really know what's inside someone, you know, especially at that age. Um, is, so. is there a, is there a I, I know, again, I'm like fishing, but these are the questions that kind of came up to me. How can you tell 
that somebody's closer to college than they are to pro and how would, would you, have you had to have those discussions with people oh today? Gosh. Well, in that case, I a hundred percent agree with Jose, you know, like the writing is on the wall. And I, I think especially now, like when I was a kid, that was it too. Like if you went to college, then you were there for four years and you were not playing tournaments while you were in school. Like they did not allow that. I mean, you know, you, yeah. you and I were both. And that's, I mean, now yeah. it's unbelievable the deal that yeah. these colleges are offering where you can go to some of these, the best schools for two years or in some, like, some cases, one semester. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and then you can go back and you have your entire, like, schooling paid for amazing deal you know like so it in my opinion like i mean look at like someone like jennifer brady you know amazing like that she went to school and she and she had a great experience and you know they they won it and now she's out and doing big things on on yeah. tour you know and so i think that like if it should be absolutely obvious that you should be on the tour. And I mean, when I say absolutely obvious, I mean, you got to be getting into the slams, you know, like you got to be top 200, you know, at the very least to really be like, I mean, I think there's a little wiggle room 200, 300, but if you yeah. are, you know, like if it's kind of below that and you're kind of, why not go to school for yeah. six months and <laughs> gosh, and have like, I mean, I mean, in college is so expensive nowadays. It's, yeah. I mean, just, they never, like, if we were kids now, I can't, I can't even imagine, like, because they just, they, it was a completely different situation back then when I was a kid. That's why I turned pro so young. But now, I mean, I think the deal is amazing and definitely worth, worth more than, you know, a look and a think by yeah. all these young players coming up. No, that's, uh, that's, that's really true. So, you know, I would say, um, and it's also a different challenge. You go with the team or you, you know, or you go by yourself and you travel. Who did you travel with? How many um, people? Yeah. <laughs> Some, I mean, my coach. By yourself? By myself. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes my mom, you know, like it was, yeah. you know, and the good players who have gone to college, like the ones, I think it's not just Americans, like you have Jenny Brady, you know, you have Bolsova who did go to Oklahoma State, you know, you have Gibbs, like those kids came out and they're, they're making dents on, on the pro tour, you know? Mm. So if you're good, then you're good. And the results are going to show it, you know? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you ready? Oh, uh, no. With the, with the, what is, what does Coco need to add to her game to, is it just age and getting older and just doing the same thing? That girl is so good. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think that that's the great thing about her is that she does have so much that she can add to her yeah. game, you know, like she's already doing what she's doing and uh, breaking through in such an amazing way and um, can get better at so many things, you know, yeah. what an amazing position to be in where the sky is just absolutely the limit, you know, like, I think that every part of her game can get better, you know, and I think that she's not afraid to get out there and do it wrong or to fail and to keep yeah. coming and to keep working at things you know and like wow what a she's gonna be i mean i think the whole kind of um generation of young americans are for me like as a former player as an american not even like as a coach but as like like an american you know who played for a fed cup and stuff like i'm incredibly proud of the group of girls kind of coming up you know i'm fans like i'm a fan yeah. of the way that they carry themselves you know their strength you know they're not afraid of the big stage they're not afraid of anybody on the other side yet they carry the, they carry themselves with such poise you know there's so much hard work but they're so humble and there's so much humility like i just think that all of those girls coco katie like whitney and Amanda, yeah. on and on, like the, the future is very bright for how all much, how, young girls. How much part of your job is interacting with them? Maybe earlier, I don't know, now? Yeah, like, how, how, earlier. How, yeah. Yeah, so um, I worked with, um, with all of them in a, like, a supplemental basis. Like definitely they all had, I think pretty much all of those girls 
they had a very strong kind of parent coach, you know, yeah. like Whitney, her father, uh, yeah. um, Amanda, her, her, you know, her late father, um, and uh, uh, Katie's mother. She was a very good tennis player in her own right. Good doubles player, great college player. And um, yeah, I think that's everyone I think yeah. I've named. Um, but yeah, they all kind of had a strong coach father um, parent in there kind of guiding them and staying behind them. And so like they came in for camps and uh, tournament play and um, definitely worked within their group and was a part of their team, but they had someone who was leading and, and riding the ship. And so um, a lot of like um, competitive situations and um, I kind of took them after Kathy as well, because Kathy worked with them initially at their like Le Petitas a mm. level, yeah. 14 and on. And so, yeah, so I've gotten to know them through from like really young ages and being on court with them during tough times. And that also must, must be is very rewarding. I can say why. Well, I mean, they, I think coaching in general is really rewarding. Yeah. Um, I think that most coaches would say that. And so that is, I think, any player that you see you see them you're working with them on something and you see them getting it you yeah. know that's pretty rewarding and that's pretty fun yeah. for all with all kids nice well, well last couple of questions and they're a little random well not random but they they're just um i guess uh, mahi one of the kids wants to know um she actually her brother sorry um he's a defensive player uh, any suggestions on how to improve his transition game to be more aggressive? All right. See, Mahi, I'm with you because I'm, I don't know um, what leads you to be defensive, but I am pretty small by tennis standards. And uh, my biggest weapon was definitely my, my movement. So I definitely saw myself as a counter puncher. So power to you. Um, I think that like I would say watch a lot of video okay watch people watch the ways that they are able to like get to net whether it's by you know an approach shot I think if you are pretty quick then and you're able to play like um physical points and make your opponent play physical points then you're gonna like gain a number of opportunities to like sneak in you know it may not be as obvious so I would say like go out and play a set and make a goal to sneak in, you know, 10 times. Like you hit a, whatever your best shot is, like hit a backhand cross court after you've, you know, run them with a, a forehand cross court and, and sneak in, you know? And by doing that, then you're going to like learn really fast. Like, okay, yes, that's correct. That's when I need to be looking to do this. Oh, you know, no, that was not right, wrong shot. Or no, yes, right shot, but like I didn't hit it well enough. Or, gosh, I have to make that decision earlier, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, discuss that kind of with your coach so that, like, when you are playing, like, practice matches, like, you are working on that. And give yourself, like, a, um, a um, I don't know, whatever you would see as a reward if you, if you actually, like, succeed with that. And it's not, like, executing. It's the doing it that's going to come first, you know? So whatever it is, like, okay, you know, I get to play 20 minutes of Animal Crossing or I get to watch my favorite show on Netflix or whatever, but if you don't do it and you can't watch those shows, like you gotta like be that. tough on yourself, you know? Um, and I would also say like, make sure that you spend like enough time in practice at net, like working on your volleys, working on your pickups, working on your overheads and stuff like that. Because obviously if you don't have the, the um, fundamentals and some confidence in your net game, then in big moments like you're gonna hesitate and you're not gonna you're not gonna come in you know so you can't really have the practice where you spend 50 minutes at the baseline and then you know you hit two volleys otherwise yeah. like your <laughs> your net game is not going to not going to get better at all but right now is a great time actually to work on that because you know that's something that can actually really get better if you do have access to a wall you know like have your parents pull their car out of the wall and you know, like try and be like Cara Black because we all have seen that, you know, uh, uh, YouTube video where she- The Roger like, challenge. Yeah, that with the ball. you know, exactly. Work on your continental skills, you know, get in there. And, and if you don't have a wall, you know, at, get a ball and bounce it up, you know, on, and did have you, your did, left hand, you know, do it right. And like, that's something that you can actually really, really improve right now that um, 
is going to out, you know, like you're this, when all this is over, it's going to show what you did, you know, yeah. it's going to get, over, it's going to be over and we're going to know what people did during this time. So I like, think, I think that's time. such, such a great piece of advice. Cause for me, I keep telling people when this is over, some people that were one will be 20 and some people that were 20 will be one. And you're going to be like, what happened? They did these little extra things, you know, whether it's mental training, working out at home, perfect time to go out and jump rope and just add different elements to your game. So yeah, um, absolutely. Be a problem solver. you know, like I fully believe that that's a huge part of the game. You know, someone who can figure things out, like, you know, in high pressure, situations and so if you become a better problem solver solver right now then that's going to make you a better tennis player you know these coping skills that we're working on now staying in the moment right now and not like panicking about what it's going to be like in two or three months if you can get better at like harnessing your mind then that's going to make you a better tennis player like we always talk about it's not just forehands and backhands you know and it really isn't and now is the time when you can really kind of improve on those other big portions of the game. Jamia, that is all I have for you. You've been amazing talking to us about juniors, pros, college, coaching. Leslie said it the best, U.S. tennis is lucky to have you. So, uh, like, so thanks, Les. And I You're really, nice. I really appreciate you taking time talking to me and the legacy team as well. And everyone who's going to watch this later. And now you're in Philly. You have to, we talked about it at the U S open last year, but you're going to definitely have to stop by oh, yeah. and make, make an appearance. So thank you. Thank you so, oh, yeah. so much. So thank um, you guys. I cannot wait to get by there and see each and every one of you. I mean, like we go so far back. I yeah. can't, you guys don't even know, like, <laughs> you guys are the best, you know, and also, like, Lover, that's, that's my, you know, we're really yeah. good friends, that's my boy, so yeah, he's, he's I can't wait to meet every, each and every one of you. <laughs> well, Go ahead, you. sorry, I cut you no, off. No, 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 nothing, I'll let you, you're, you're great, thank you, thank you all of us for joining, Leslie, thank you, Sean, thank you, and everyone else that I didn't mention on this call, thank you guys, and uh, stay safe, everybody. Yes, stay safe, everybody. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Take care. See ya.